So in this lecture, I'm gonna cover a few key troubleshooting issues. Now, what do I mean by troubleshooting issues? I mean, issues that are perhaps common enough to warrant just a quick explanation for how you may want to solve them when migrating from AngularJS to Angular. Now, I've gotten, or I've, I know about these issues from just being asked questions online, after conferences, and after workshops I've given on migration. And I think two of the most popular questions I get are, what do I do with all of my scope watches in my AngularJS application? And the other one I get is, well, what do I do about all of my emit and broadcast functionality, again, in my AngularJS application? Now, unfortunately, I personally believe it, and it didn't become clear to me until much, much later on in my career as an AngularJS developer, but I eventually realized that if I saw a lot of scope watches in my application, it was probably a sign that I had a poor architecture. And the same goes for emit and broadcast. So I made sure that I tried to, at least in my, in my latter career of AngularJS, I tried to make sure that I would use as, least, as less of this as possible. But even my applications use scope watch and use emit and broadcast. But some people's applications use this so much that they just struggle to even figure out how to migrate this to Angular because Angular doesn't have these concepts at all. So let me start off with the first one. Let's first deal with what do I do with Scope Watch? And to answer this question, I'm going to tell you the story of the form. Okay, so I used to work in a firm where we had this form and it became just a running joke because this form had bugs constantly. And every time we'd fix a bug, it would then, uh, another bug would appear, and we basically, it became the form, like this big, ugly thing we had to deal with all the time. Now why, what were the issues, what was the story of this form, and to explain it, so I wanna show you something now, this isn't exactly the architecture of the form, but I think it's close enough that it explains, at least helps explain the, the, the issues without really getting too deep into specifics. So we had three levels of controllers in our application. And maybe in the lowest level controller, we had a form with some input fields. Now, our controllers, you know, they weren't using controller as syntax, okay? The yellow controller was actually using scope inheritance. So it's, 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 it's reading values from the red controller's scope property, okay? So we're not using controller as, we actually literally are using inheritance here. And also the controllers were being, the, the variables were being set up via lots of asynchronous function calls. So you never quite knew when data was gonna be set. And then those asynchronous calls would come back at some point in the future, and then that would trigger a whole other bunch of calculations. Now everything was using two-way ng model with two-way binding. So all those input fields were bound to variables on the scope. And then scope watches were set up to listen to see if any of those variables changes and then perhaps do some validation or make some checks and then set some other scope properties which are then bound to other scope variables and it kind of goes like that in a little a merry-go-round. Now one of the things that would happen with this form is that tests sometimes passed and sometimes failed. So what we'd have is imagine you, the user had set some value in one input field, this would trigger a scope watch which would then set some other value in the scope which would then obviously display that in the input field, and that also would trigger another scope watch, which would then change some other value, and then that would trigger another scope watch, and which would change another value, and then, oh my God, it changes the original value again. So then you go around in a circle. Now what would happen is that tests would sometimes pass, the same tests would sometimes pass and sometimes fail, and that's because of the asynchronous nature of some of the watches and some of the dependencies. And this meant the same inputs, putting the same inputs in the same form fields can actually result in different outputs. And for me, that's the actual definition of chaos theory. And this is why there's actually no scope watch in Angular. Instead, we've got something else called observables. Okay, so again, go to uh, codecraft.tv. We're not gonna cover observables in, in any depth, but we cover RxJS and observables in a lot of depth on my website, codecraft.tv, in the Angular course. But just to give you a quick overview, this is how we would solve the similar problem, or this is how we would rewrite your scope watch code in Angular. We'd essentially use observables. So each form in Angular has uh, something called a value changes property. Each model form has something called a value changes property, which is an observable. 
Now this is a JSON representation of the whole form and all of its fields. So if it has a form with the first and last name, this would be a JSON object which has a property of first with the value asymmetric property called last with the value Hussein. Now every time the form changes, this JSON object would be updated and we'd start going through this chain of events. Now this is a typical one we would have with a form. We would then basically pass it to a filter and we'd say, hey, look, if the form isn't valid, then don't even bother passing it to the next item in the chain. Then we might have something called debounce time, which basically says, hey, don't pass it to the next step in the chain unless that 400 milliseconds has passed. And then we can say, well, no matter what, with distinct until change, don't pass it until the next step until we know that the value is distinctly unique. Okay. So if someone types, if you delete ASIN and add ASIN back in again, it's actually the same JSON object. So do you really need to process it? Probably not. So that's why I add the distinct until change. Now with the map, observable you, you provide a callback function and this is possibly the closest to your scope watch this is a function that will be called every time those values changed then you can subscribe to that and you can do different things like you can call apis or, or whatever else you want and also with the form you can use functions like set value or patch value which can then set the other form values back again so if you did want to have an observable chain which then changes some value of the form again you would then use the function set value or patch value so just a hint, I'm not going to go into too much depth, but this is just a hint of what you need to do with your scope watches to move from AngularJS to Angular. You need to start using observables, which does mean you, pop, you have to think about your application a bit differently and you have to code your application a bit differently. Okay, so that was how to deal with scope watches. The other big question I get is what about emit and broadcast? So this is how we did kind of event-driven development in AngularJS. We would use scope.emit and scope.broadcast to send uh, events up and down the scope chain. Now there's no equivalent of that in Angular. You could build the equivalent, you could build something very, very similar to this in Angular. There's nothing built core in the framework with this because, well, it, it does have problems. I mean, it makes your application harder to reason about when you have to figure out what is capturing an event. And there are better ways of architecting an Angular application, such as just using the inputs and outputs properly. But there is a solution for this. It's a temporary solution. There's no, without re-architecting your application, there's no complete solution. But if you are running in hybrid mode or, you, or you want to start running in hybrid mode and you need to communicate between an AngularJS entity that's, that's sending out an event and a Angular entity that wants to capture the event just temporarily, just until you, you're in the process of hybrid mode and you're in the process of migration, you need something that works just temporarily while you are in that process of migration, then there is a solution. And it's just by doing something we should know how to do by now, which is essentially temporarily upgrading an Angular service, an AngularJS service, so it can be used inside Angular. And the AngularJS service we want to up temporarily upgrade is actually the root scope. So root scope is something that we can use to emit and broadcast or to at least capture events on with, with the on function. So just the same way as we've used in our, in our course so far, we could just create one of these, add it in the AJS upgraded providers, and then we can provide the root scope provider over to our ng module. So we create a token called root scope, an injection token. And this is going, essentially going to be upgrading the dollar root scope from the Angular JS service. And then we're then going to provide this in our ng module, just the same way as we've done before. And then to use this in our Angular components, we would just inject the root scope into whatever constructor that we have. And then when we wanted to use it, we could use this root scope, root scope emit, broadcast, and on. So not a permanent solution. I mean, when you want to eventually drop AngularJS, you do have to find an architectural solution for this. But if you just need something that works during the process of migration, during this hybrid mode, then this is something that can work for you.